because if you eat corn, lots of corn without uh, nixtamalizing it, you can develop a, a, a vitamin B deficiency. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's it's known as uh, pellagra. And yeah. so when the Spaniards actually came to Central and South America, they, they saw um, these native people that were thriving and they were eating so much corn. And so they took corn back to Europe, but they didn't take the process of nixtamalization with them. And people started getting sick because they started eating a, a diet with more rich in corn, but without it being nixtamalized. So, Jonathan, welcome to the Layered Onion Podcast. Maybe you could introduce yourself and tell us about your company. Uh, yeah, so my name is Jonathan Correa. I am the owner and operator of La Cosecha Tortilla Company. Uh, we are a 100% uh, nixtamal uh I like to, yeah, I like to describe it as 100% next to model tortillas uh, and tortilla chips. Uh, we specialize in uh, in Mexican, we're starting to specialize more in just like overall like Mexican uh, products or Hispanic products. Um, but the core of our business is the fresh next to model tortillas and tortilla chips. Um, and what that means is <clears throat> it is next to is the traditional process that um, Mesoamericans have been using in Central and South America for thousands of years to make uh, fresh masa and, and things like that. So it's a process of <clears throat> cooking corn in a uh, alkaline solution. And so that's a mixture of water. And in the case of uh, <clears throat> in Mexico, they use cal, which is a type of limestone that's been superheated to uh, transform the chemical structure of it. And so the stone actually starts out kind of a grayish color. And then they superheat that in an oven, and then that creates a white stone that you can turn into powder. Um, and then when you mix that with water, it creates an alkaline solution. And that alkaline solution dissolves the pericarp on the outside of the corn, which is a very difficult to digest. <clears throat> and along that process, uh, there are nutrients that are kind of transformed and made more bioavailable in the corn. Um, and um, this creates a more nutritious product. And uh, the reason why that's important is because that's kind of been a staple food product in, in Mexico and South America for a long time, <clears throat> um, because that transformation makes the corn more nutritious. Because if you eat corn, lots of corn without uh, nixtamalizing it, you can develop a, a, a vitamin B deficiency. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's, it's known as uh, pellagra. And yeah. so when the Spaniards actually came to Central and South America, they, they saw... Um, these native people that were thriving and they were eating so much corn. And so they took corn back to Europe, but they didn't take the process of nixtamalization with them. And people started getting sick because they started eating a, a diet with more rich in corn, but without it being nixtamalized. Mm. Um, and so for me, it's about uh, celebrating my culture um, and reconnecting with a culture that I was disconnected from because I'm a fourth generation uh person in in america uh my family on my father's side immigrated here from mexico back in the 1920s and then on my mom's side they actually immigrated here as well in the about the night in the 1920s from germany and sicily so i'm uh, kind of a melting pot myself <laughs> just like the country um, so how did you learn about the process um grandparents or so the for me uh i actually it was a process of trial and error uh, I didn't have anybody to teach me how to do it. Oh. I just, I went to culinary school here in Madison uh, for two years, and I've always loved cooking since I was a kid. And uh, through that journey of becoming a, a, a professional cook, I started noticing um, that, you know, no one was really doing these next to tortillas in, in, um, in the area. And I wanted to find a way to, like I said, connect with my culture, because over the years, generationally, um, you know, we started losing um, the connection to both sides of my family um, as far as just like where we came from and, and those um, traditions and things like that. So um, <clears throat> for me, the process of learning was trial and error of nixtamalizing corn at home, reading the magic of, of Instagram and <laughs> connecting with people. Uh -huh. um, I had some very wonderful um, Mexicans that I reached out to and just asked questions and they were willing to, to be a, a, a valuable resource for me. Um, and then 
So I was just nixonizing corn and grinding, hand grinding it at home and a little hand grinder and just experimenting. Um, and then in 2019, I went to Mexico City before the pandemic really hit. And uh, I got the chance to go to Pujol and talk to them a little bit about it. I had dinner there and then just started talking to them and they brought me a, a sample of masa and was like, this is what you're looking for. Like this is, this is perfect masa and this is what you're shooting for. And so <clears throat> every day when I'm grinding, I'm always going back to that memory of, of this is what perfect masa feels like. And uh, so I'm continuing to work towards. Well, it that. starts with corn, right? Yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> so what varieties of corn are the best? Obviously a blue corn, right? Yeah. Um, so in my, uh, in my experience, uh, the, the best corns actually do come from Mexico. The heirloom varieties from Mexico, uh, in my experience, it, it, there's no, it's hard to find any varieties that compare. Um, they can be found like right now, like we work with Metal Arc Organics, uh, for our white corn, um, and some other suppliers for that. Um, we also work with some farmers in Iowa and Ohio <clears throat> that grow corn and, and trying to find varieties that work really well. Um, so <clears throat> there are some varieties that that uh, are grown domestically that do work really well for tortillas. And I'm grateful that I found those those options. Um, but in my experience, when I first started, I first started uh, with working with companies that were importing corn from small growers in Mexico. And the, the, the flavor and um, color diversity for Mexico is just really, it's really amazing. Um, so that's, to me, it's the best, um, the corns and the growers I work with now, like their corn is, is amazing too. And I'm just grateful that I found some growers in the area to, to work I, with. I would assume some of it's the growing season <clears throat> because it has a very long growing season <clears throat> compared to here in, in the U S correct. Is that yeah. part of it? I mean, that's a part of it, but also, um, you know, in Mexico, uh, they, they have many different varieties, but people have been selecting corn to be nixtamalized and to be used for whether it's tortillas or pozole or uh for for you know frying and, and making more crispy and and so people have been have been very intentional with their breeding you know in mm -hmm. mexico for to to nixtamalize the corn and a lot of the corn that's grown in the u.s um you know has its roots in those varieties of corn but they haven't been um up until i feel like recently haven't been that kind of thought process has been put into um, the production of corn, um, which is part of the reason why I actually just started working with a group um, led by Keith Williams, who's a corn breeder here in the Midwest. Uh, and he um, gathered up a bunch of us uh, nixtamal tortilla producers, uh, a few of us from around the country, to help him in his breeding work to focus on uh, helping him breed varieties that are better suited for nixtamal and um that that's it. that's the focus of it. So it's really fun to see that people are starting to to see that there's corn isn't just corn. You know, it's it's uh, some varieties are better for next to mall than others. Well, and so much of the corn that's grown mm -hmm. in the Midwest, of course, is feed corn mm -hmm. and is not you know, for eating. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is really awesome that you found a breeder, mm -hmm. someone that's really wants to work toward it. Yeah. Um, you would not know this, but my um, undergrad mm -hmm. was in agronomy. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, that's awesome. Yeah. In, a, mm -hmm. in another life, I was in agriculture. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, me, me too. Uh, yeah, me too. You know, I, I worked on a farm after, after culinary, well, in culinary school and after that and did some, uh, tried to, to run a farm with my with my ex for for a number of years because I love love getting my hands in the soil and love getting dirty and love learning mm -hmm. about that and um, I I'm really I really love soil biology too I'm really nerdy about the the, the symbiotic relationship between plants and, we just and had green box here okay so <laughs> he, yeah. would have, we, he would have gotten nerdy on us about yeah. compost soil yeah <laughs> so yeah. Well, Jonathan, I know one of the things <clears throat> that um, you are a part of Dane County Food Collective, mm -hmm. and one of the efforts that we found jointly was really working on the shallot, but bringing culinary art into the shallot and really working together on mental wellness. Mm -hmm. And I know that you kind of have a story as well about how really maybe being a chef and and really going back to your roots helped with mental wellness. Do you maybe want to share that? Um, 
Yeah, I'll try to try to um, consolidate it as best I can. Um, so for me, um, I think that as as chefs and as cooks and and people who work in the food industry, like we express ourselves through food or through service. You know, um, I think that many of us grow up in. Um, a lot of our fondest memories usually are around food and spent with family and, and sharing food and, and those those things. And so for me, um, you know, I um, express myself through food. Um, when I was a young kid, I remember just like growing up and watching like the original Iron Chef and all those in <laughs> Emeril Lagasse and all these like really <laughs> inspiring like shows that um kind of gave me like the insight that like, oh, there's, there's a career, there's, there's a way of expressing yourself through food. And I kind of lost track of that as a teenager when I got into sports and things like that. Um, <clears throat> but I have a, I have kind of a complicated relationship with food uh, because food was my first addiction. Mm. You know, I was very, I was overweight. I was obese for most of my young life from probably about like 10 until I was well, maybe like eight or nine until the time I was probably 18, 19 years old when I finally overcame that struggle with obesity. Um, and so, but then, but through that, um, overcoming that struggle with obesity was also through food. It was learning how to cook better, learning how to, learning about more about nutrition and, and um, you know, getting away from processed foods and, and a lot of processed foods and sugar and things like that. Um, so food has been, food has been, uh, kind of a double-edged sword for me throughout mm -hmm. my life. It's been a, it's been a, a, an addiction, but it's also been a way to express myself and can reconnect with my culture and, and, um, share a part of myself with, uh, with the world. So what then brought you to make the leap from being a chef <clears throat> to starting your own business? Well, the pandemic, <laughs> I mean, to, to really, yeah, to really what it was is like I had, um, I had dreamed of, of starting this business for a long time. Um, when I was really passionate about working in agriculture, I was like, I'm going to grow the corn for my tortillas and I'm going to make them and I'm going to do the whole vertically integrate the whole process and just very like big, big headed, big dreams as far as like what I thought I was capable of at the time. And, um, <clears throat> and, uh, um, you know, I was working with somebody else at the time to start a, a restaurant that was kind of focused around this and, um, that relationship didn't work out very well. Um, but I can, wanted to continue pushing forward with this cause I had started it and I was like, okay, like I can, I can go out on my own and the pandemic hit and I lost my, I lost that job. And, uh, a good friend of mine was, uh, you know, saw what I was doing and he believed in me and he was like, hey, I have a bar that I can't open. I can't use. There's a flat top in there. There's a range. He's like, you can use it while we're, while we're shut down. And um, if you make it big, you know, you can reimburse me then. So uh, for about eight months during the pandemic, I myself and, and uh, a, a friend at the time, we <clears throat> were next. We, I bought a thousand dollars worth of corn. And I rented some equipment and we just made tortillas on a little four by four flat top in a, <laughs> in a bar on the east side um, for like eight months, just side by side and just slowly but surely, you know, reaching out to, to connections I had in the, in, the, in the restaurant industry in Madison and Vitruvian Farms. They had to make a quick pivot too from being, you know, uh, sending stuff to restaurants. They had to, they pivoted very quickly to delivering groceries at home. Had a relationship with them they're like yeah sure we'll start carrying your tortillas and pasture and plenty you know that's how i got the space in the make shop was because christy uh from pasture and plenty she was one of my first uh supporters and when i was in that bar <laughs> and um yeah that's kind of how it got going and just like one tortilla at a time we just kept building it until i got to a place where it felt like um um it was a good idea to make that leap you know to, to full time. To full time. Yeah. So one thing that mm -hmm. we met at mm -hmm. uh, an event that was held this summer at a farm, mm -hmm. and one of the things that you did were, were was educating about mm -hmm. the whole process of making tortillas, and the the whole event was really, I think, um, folks sharing some of their heritage and. Um, you know, because it wasn't just you, there was mm -hmm. others, some Native American uh, heritage, et cetera. But 
Is that part of your goals is to really think about giving back and educating people? Yeah, yeah, I think that's for me that is a that is a big part of it. Um, the fun part about that event is was that um, you know in, in Mexico there are native there are natives, you know what I mean? I don't think a lot of people realize that. It's that that there is there is um, you know natives to America are very diverse, you know, and so it was really fun to bring uh, a, a small part of that native uh, Mexican uh, culture up here or like part of that here to be able to share with people and to also kind of talk to uh, people who are, are whose heritage lies in Native Americans around here. Um, and yeah, the education piece for me is is important because this is an art that is um, kind of been dying over the years. Like I, I mentioned earlier, like I just hired my first Hispanic employee and she's from Mexico. She lived in Mexico City and for most of her life. And I asked her, I was like, Amiga, do you know anything about Next to Mall? And she was like, no, I don't know anything. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. Like, I don't know the process at all. So it's, uh -huh. it's, um, it's fun to be able to educate people who, you know, who um, were born and raised in Mexico about it. And it's also fun to be able to show people in America that, um, a tortilla is just not a tortilla. The tortillas that you can buy on the shelf that are sitting there and shelf stable for months, like that's not a real tortilla. The the flavor and the nutrition and everything that you're getting in that is 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 it's not that's not that's not a real tortilla. When a real tortilla is made from fresh masa, it just has three simple ingredients, and that's corn, water, and a trace of lime. And um, uh, to be able to be an ambassador for that is really it was really important to me. So is it is the basis the Aztec culture or what what a native people? Um, you know my I can't and I I, I it's it's kind of it's not the Aztecs. So the Aztecs okay. um, it it even it even predates the Mayans if I understand it correctly. Okay. Because um, Nixtamal, I mean, no one really knows like when it started or where it started or how it started. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in Mexico, it does predate the Aztecs because there are there's temples all over all over Mexico that were, um, you know, were Mayan temples at one point that the Aztecs, you know, conquered and, and built on top of. And like Teotihuacan is, mm -hmm. you know, people think of it the Aztecs, but the Aztecs weren't the first people there. They actually built on top of of uh, structures that were already there. Um, so there's. I can't remember the name of the the people, but there was there were people there before the Aztecs that were doing doing the next demo and, and um, yeah. So maybe talk a little bit about the health of <clears throat> these versus the tortilla, because of course that is what most people think, mm -hmm. and um, you know these are soft. Mm -hmm. Those and... were actually made fresh probably like an hour ago. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So that, that they're soft mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I got the opportunity to actually make them mm -hmm. with you and that was pretty exciting. And it was, mm -hmm. it was a lot more, there's a lot of skill involved. Yeah. And so I think, you know, people see a package and they would not understand the skill and, and how, you know, it, it bubbles up when you're yeah, cooking and, and, and taking it at the right moment. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe you could kind of talk about that and, and um, sort of the nutrition. Um, yeah, so with uh, with these, like I said, it's just uh, corn, water, and then there is a trace of lime uh, in there, but essentially it's just corn and water because uh, we don't add any, any lime to it. It's just the lime that is just like naturally in the liquid that the corn is cooked in. Um, and so... You know, right now I'm I'm very fortunate that I have some automation, so I'm not I'm not hand pressing tortillas anymore. <laughs> I'm not I'm not doing that. I have some some more uh, control over that over that side. But the mm -hmm. from the nutritional aspect, uh, you know, we only use non GMO and organic or regeneratively grown varieties of corn, and that's important to us from a um, from not only like a, a sustainability standpoint, but also from a nutrition standpoint because mm -hmm. like uh, because our growers are focused on building stronger, healthier soils. Um, all the growers that we work with are all in, based in the Midwest. Um, and so they're all focused on, on creating healthier soils, which um, are gonna create healthier plants and healthier food for us. <clears throat> um, the, you know, the protein content, the fiber content are gonna be superior in these tortillas. We, there is no ad any additives or preservatives in there. So, as, so that's another health standpoint that I think is important because I think as we're learning now that the the 
I feel like obviously you know you we don't know what we don't know. So in the in the in the in in the moment when um, having food that was shelf stable for a long time was important because we didn't have a lot of preservation or you know things like that. It's important, but you know um, you know there's there can be side effects with those preservatives and 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 things like that. So. Um, <clears throat> So there's no additives in, in any of our in any of our products, um, and then the the micronutrient standpoint, I haven't seen any tests on, and I've I've only seen tests on. Uh, so we work with a regenerative farmer in Ohio and and uh, Iowa, and um, they've worked with some of the school like some of the researchers they've worked with have done. Um, done analysis on so like the blue corn that we get is like a blue blue claridge <clears throat> variety that's regeneratively grown and um, so the the zinc and the selenium and and the protein content and all these things are, are much much higher than than the, the conventional corn that's out there um, and I think that uh, part of the reason why we're having health problems in this country is because the quality of our food and the nutrient density of our food has just really been diminishing. And, um, you know, an orange, you know, 50 years ago had four to five times the amount of vitamin C as an orange now. And that has implications over time on people's mm -hmm. health. Um, so that's another part of the reason why I think it's so important that we're making um something with the highest quality grains that we can find um, to feed people. So, so I see you're also doing salsa. Yeah, that's a, that was a farmer's market ad that we started last year when we did our first farmer's market in Lake Geneva. Uh, and they were a huge hit. These are two salsas that I was making for different pop-ups that I had done at the Imaginary Factory and Robin Room around town and stuff like that during the winters. Um, the last couple of years and uh, so as a compliment to my products to the farmers market I started doing the salsas and now that they've kind of started to um, get a, a following of their own so we're I do the salsas um, now for all of our farmers markets and um, in the next month or so they'll be in the, the Willie Street co-op too so oh. yeah super cool yeah no i'm very excited about that i'm excited about that i wish our tortillas were gonna get 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 there first but it seems like the salsas are gonna get there before the tortillas but that's okay that's and what about the chips now <clears throat> what do you do different with the chips versus the tortillas so same process uh the chips go through our machine um which is tortilla equipment is really i have this side of me that like loves like mechanical things so like the the that's when a good thing as a business owner because you yeah. have to fix it. Oh yeah, and that's well, that's another thing too. When when you have equipment that comes from Mexico and you uh. don't have uh, a, a uh, uh, customer service that's you know right in your back door <laughs> or any sort of local um, you know equipment sailor who has experience with the machines, you kind of have to learn to mm. to fix them yourselves and and figure out the the ins and outs of them. Um, so uh, there's no difference. It's the same next same masa that we use for our tortillas, except for for our chips. Uh, we have a different die cutter that it goes through. So the masa is uh, kind of punched out, kind of like cookie cutter style on an automated oven. So for the tortillas, it just kind of gets cut out in a circle and then goes onto a heated griddle that uh, kind of goes back and forth and then it comes outside out, out the other and cooked. Um, and then we do the same thing for our chips um, and then they get um, they get fried, very lightly salted and that's it. So same thing, very minimal ingredients uh, with those. Um, and yeah. All right. Well, yeah. super cool. And we really control the, the, our chips have kind of gotten a per, like a following of their own, um, through a lot of our really wonderful restaurant customers. And, um, we really try to control like down to the gram, like how much the, the, the chips weigh so that the thickness is perfect. So they can hold up for like chilaquiles at Marigold kitchen or nachos at the Ohio. Like they hold up to, to like sauces and salsas really well. They don't. And that <laughs> is a big deal. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's another, another aspect of like doing tortillas and chips in this, in this way where you're making fresh masa. Um, a lot of larger scale chips and tortillas that are, are on the market are made from masa arena, which is, it's a corn flour product that you add water to, um, <clears throat> but they're trying to get the, as much as they possibly can out of that product. And so they're thinner, the quality isn't, isn't as, as um, good as far as like the thickness and the quality of the corn. And it, it adds a lot to the flavor and the, mm -hmm. the texture of the chips. Well, I've had the chips and... <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. at the, the farm event we were at. Yeah, yeah mm. that was great. Yeah. So let me ask you this. You know, a lot of um, folks in the food service industry, you talked about first having the food addiction, but a lot of people in the food service industry, <clears throat> as I've talked to more and more people, there is there really was a culture of alcohol addiction and other mental health challenges. And I know, aren't you uh, in a working on a as an advisor in a program i am not working as an advisor in a program but i am a part of uh, a group session that goes on okay through, through uh through the dane county food collective um so i joined that um i was a little nervous to do that i mean i've done therapy and other things like that but i've never done therapy in a group setting before mm. so it was a little i was a little apprehensive about it but it's been um it's been really powerful for for me to have that have that group of people to kind of talk to and bounce things off of and, and everything. So what, so <clears throat> what do you think is, is, um, you know, the most difficult part of being in this industry and that being a chef, being sort of in the food service industry that really, I was surprised at how many folks, um, really have a lot of, of wellness challenges, both physical and mental. Mm -hmm. And what do you think is is the biggest piece of that? Well, I think that the, the biggest piece of that is that, um, especially in the restaurant side, I mean, I still have, I feel, I feel like I gave up some stresses from like getting off the line and getting off of like working as like as a cook and working as a, like in the service industry and then took on other stresses that an entrepreneur and food producer mm -hmm. would take on. Um, but, uh, I think the biggest thing is that, um, <clears throat> is we're, you know, we are very passionate about things. So a lot of us that work in the industry are passionate about what we do and we want to give people the best service and the best quality products that we can. Um, but there is a, there's a pace of doing that, that can, can wear on you. Um, and the, um, just that day-to-day -day, like demand that can be put on you and the, and sometimes the crazy hours and, and it can be, it can be really, um, it's, yeah, it's really demanding. And I think that <clears throat> in general, in society, we are not um, being given the tools as kids to cope in a healthy way. And so everybody, and I think not everybody, but most of us are learning unhealthy coping mechanisms and, and unfortunately, um, in the service industry, especially on the restaurant side, we have easy access to alcohol. And <clears throat> um, I love a shift drink as much as the next person, but I feel like that can be easily lead to um, <clears throat> can lead to maybe struggles with alcohol and things like that. Um, but I think it's just that the, the high stress, high demand, high pace, um, high expectations, especially <clears throat> excuse me, if we're working in. Uh, in a city like Madison, we're known for the, the quality of our restaurants, the quality of our food and everything, and people have a very high standard, and we wanna make our customers happy, we wanna put out the best things, and um, if you don't have healthy coping mechanisms, then you're gonna use the easiest out that you have to, mm -hmm. to help to, um, help deal with that stress. And help. There's water there if yeah. you want it. Yeah. <laughs> Just for you. <laughs> <clears throat> so <clears throat> let me ask you this. What is yeah. your dream? For, oh, first of all, yeah. I want to. So let's have you pronounce your business again. Look. La Cosecha. La Cosecha. We yeah. say it again. La Cosecha. It La means the harvest. Yes, it means the harvest. Yes. And so <clears throat> what is your dream? Um. Well, my dream. Uh, well, do we want to. Do we want to talk about, uh, well, I don't even want to say unrealistic, but there's like, there's a, there's a part of me that, uh, that has aspirations and like big, big goals of like, what would it be like to just snag like a small portion of the market share from someone like Frito-Lay? Mm -hmm. That would feel really rewarding to be able to like, obviously it's a multi-billion dollar company and that's like a big aspiration, but I think that... <clears throat> My, my, my goal is to just continue to provide uh, uh, the highest quality products I can for people um, to make uh, eating tortillas that are, that are made fresh and made with local grains um, and the highest quality ingredients possible, more available to people and to, to, to get them into more homes um, and to 
um, <clears throat> just nourish as, as many people as I can. Uh, because like I mentioned, you know, I struggled with obesity as a kid. And uh, I feel like if we were to, even if we were to keep the same diet that we have right now, but replace all of the like cheap ingredients and all the fillers and all the nonsense with higher quality ingredients that we could actually transform the health of our society by just using higher quality products, higher quality ingredients, um, because we have more nutrition. Um, and then also, you know, by using higher quality ingredients, by supporting farmers that are, that are growing higher quality crops and not just focused on yield, but co focused on nutrition and flavor, um, that we could also have a huge impact on, on our farmers too. Um, and that's something that I really am passionate about as well on that side is that, you know, there's a way for us to, and I'm seeing through this, which is really cool, is there's a way to um, impact our local economy through, you know, when you buy a pack of tortillas from me, you're, you're not only supporting me and my family and my workers, but you're also supporting a farm and their family and their workers. And <clears throat> that money stays in our local economy. And I, th I think that that could be really powerful. So... Yeah, my goal is to just keep growing it and continue to get my tortillas and chips into as many and many home homes and as possible. So how do we make it accessible for people who are lower income? Because that's one of the things I think that has is the saddest part is that um, people who who are struggle social economically, mm -hmm. they are the ones who often end up with you know, having to purchase, living in food deserts yep. and having to purchase food that, you know, has a lot of fillers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I know that where my spouse is from, they don't have a grocery, the nearest grocery store is about 20 miles away. Mm -hmm. And so quick trip or the dollar yeah. store is the options. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's a desert. And how do we make this kind of food accessible for folks? Well, if I've, you know, that is, that is a really tough, it's a, that's a tough, uh, uh, question to answer, you know, um, you know, I grew up, I wouldn't say, you know, kind of same thing, this small, small town, Wisconsin. So the nearest grocery store was like 10 miles away, you know, small convenience store, you know, small gas stations and things like that were the, you know, the closest thing that we had. Um, and I think it's it's slowly happening but i would like to see more just like food hubs and and different and different things like that that make um connecting people to higher quality food a lot easier um and finding ways to create those food hubs um and one thing that i really appreciate with some of the markets that i'm at um and i know madison does a really good job of this is the is the um the people being able to use like SNAP benefits and things like that at farmers markets to buy higher quality things, higher quality produce. You know what I mean? Like people mm -hmm. can come and buy my products at, at any, you know, at markets and use their, use their, their SNAP, uh, which I think is really important. And so I think that finding ways to continue to um, make those resources available for people, I think is really important. And um, yeah, just finding more ways to collaborate on delivering products to people. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that we, we find ways in this country to subsidize, um, I, wanted, I don't, yeah, some things that we, we need to do a better job of just like, like if we're going to subsidize, um, sending money to other countries or subsidize, uh, you know, agriculture that isn't good for the environment or good for our health, like we need to take some of that and put it towards being able to help people get access to higher quality food. And, and, um, uh, yeah, so hopefully our government can, can, we can continue to push our government to make those choices, but if not, then it just can, it's uh, us as a community and as people need to continue to, to find creative ways to get higher quality food to people. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think when we think about SNAP benefits, um, <clears throat> they did increase it during the pandemic, but, you know, they went right back down. And yeah. so it's difficult sometimes if you have just only so much to buy mm -hmm. the higher quality stuff, yeah. you know? Yeah. So we have to think about yeah. that. Um, maybe there's a way to reward for, you know, buying higher quality. Yeah. You know, less less <clears throat> healthy. Because in the end, you you pay it on the back end yeah. with healthcare, right? Yep. 
So yeah, that's why I'm, I've been very passionate for a long time about like health and wellness is because like I grew up, you know, not if coming from a very affluent area, you know, my parents didn't have a lot of money. I grew up and I was very unhealthy and like, you know, that's where I put most of my effort is on in my, even though I don't make a lot of money right now, mm -hmm. you know, the people think that a lot of entrepreneurs are just, you know, swimming and in, swimming in, in, <laughs> in cash because they own their own business, but that's not, that's not the yeah, case any right of us now. Know. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, but that's where I put a lot of my, my, my focus on is just eating better. But also, um, you know, for me, I, I've had people tell me like, oh, you need to raise your prices. You need to raise your prices. Like you could make more money on your products. And I want, I don't want this to be, uh, a, um, a splurge for somebody or something, you know what I mean? Like we, we've kept our prices pretty, pretty steady. Um, and I, I could, you know, charge an extra dollar a pack at the farmer's market, maybe even more in some places. Mm -hmm. But I I don't ever want to I want to do my best to not price somebody out of being able to buy my products because I'd rather you be able to afford to eat them every week than it just be like, oh, we're going to splurge this week on mm -hmm. on these fancy tortillas or because or, some places do that. I've seen other, you know, people who are doing <clears throat> the work that we're doing. Um, charge a lot because for their products and not saying that they don't you people don't deserve to make more money for the things that they're doing um, because it's a lot of work um, but there is a balance of being able to make it affordable to everybody and not just um, the members of society that are making you know a lot of money and they can afford to just you know buy the highest end ingredients and and eat them at their home Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you, kind yeah. of a, a, a in wrapping mm -hmm. up. If you were going to um, give some advice to nine-year-old Jonathan, what advice would you give to Jonathan? Ooh. What advice would I give to nine-year-old Jonathan? <laughs> it's not your fault mm -hmm. yeah all the all the things that uh the the bad things that have ever happened in life are not your fault you're not uh you're not to blame you're not the the source of of all of the bad things it's not you you know so and that's it's really tough for a young person to not think that, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, yeah. It's it's really it's really hard, you know. Um, as a parent, not myself, and as somebody who's working through recovering from my own um, addictions and and poor behavior in relationships and 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 just like mental health struggles that I've had, um, just learning to I have to learn to rewire my own nervous system. And to relearn how to, you know, have conversations with myself and, and, you know, now as a father, um, I feel like I feel like I'm parenting myself over again, mm. you know, like I'm growing up over again because I'm seeing um, the, the moments in the areas where people didn't show up for me the way that I show up for, for my daughter and my son. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, so. Well, you know. I, I hear you. I, I often hear <clears throat> this, that people just really wish that they had had um, more confidence in their own voice. And, and, and um, so I'm sure you'll, be there for your kids because it's easy to reflect back and think but um you know i i wish you well thank you yeah yeah i have i have a lot of i'm grateful because i have um you know in the past i really made myself alone i, I didn't uh, realize that i had as much community and support that i actually do um, and when i learned to stop <clears throat> making myself an island and and 
running away from things that are uncomfortable and running away from being vulnerable and like being willing to like have hard conversations or set boundaries and all of those things that, you know, you wish that you would have learned as a young adult so that you could set you up to be, have healthy relationships and, and, um, you know, be a healthier individual, um, you know, learning all that right now, but it's through, through community, through being willing to be vulnerable with other people, being willing to have hard conversations, being willing to join groups, you know what I mean? Like the, I really, um, the, the group therapy sessions through the Dane, Dane, uh, uh, Dane County Food Collective, um, I didn't think I was going to, I knew that I wasn't going to get something valuable out of it, but I've learned a lot. Um, and then it, a lot of it is not only just because we're working with two wonderful therapists, but also because I'm sharing, um, with so many other wonderful people and seeing that I'm not alone in my struggles, mm -hmm. that, um, I'm not wrong for my mistakes, you know, and that like, we're all human and that we can, if we're, if we, if we can be vulnerable with each other, we can actually support each other and, and, and help each other grow. And Well, thank you for sharing yeah. that because I think that makes a difference for people to hear it. And it's hard to say it out loud. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, that's one of the things with the Layered Onion by us talking about um, how art can be a healing and, you know, all of this can be a healing mechanism. It's first having to say it out loud. Yeah. That was step one. Yeah. And so thank you for being so brave. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to, to share my story with more people. And, um, you know, I will say one thing is that I, I've learned <clears throat> through that group and other things is that, you know, and I can only speak of this as, as, a, as a man, you know, and as that, you know, right now, like, you know, close to 75% of suicides in this country, you know, are, are men. Um, and, it, and we, because we don't, we're, it's so hard for us to have these, these hard conversations and be vulnerable. And um, just, I hope they know that they're not alone, that you can talk to people about things. And I've had a lot of good men and good people in general, but good men show up for me in these hard times that I've had the last, the last couple of years. And, um, I just hope people can, um, know that like you can be vulnerable. It's scary. It's very scary, but you can lean into it and you'll be stronger on the other side of it if you do. Well, thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate that because I think hopefully we won't see this in, in our, you know, children mm -hmm. coming that, there's been a real crisis right now, but maybe from all of this, people will learn to share and, and be more vulnerable. Yeah, that's why I do it. I mean, that's why I'm learn, trying to learn and grow is because like I have two mm -hmm. kids and I see other kids in the world and I don't, if, if they could have 10% less suffering than I had when I was a kid, like that's, that's a win to me, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And we can continue to do better as a society. Like we can, we can come back from from the things that we're struggling with right now. So, mm -hmm. well, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Can we just walk?